Okay, very good morning everyone. It's Wednesday 21st of August. Um, before actually I go on to introduce what we're going to cover, just going to quickly transition over to the charts. A little bit of an uptick just as I was about to press the, the start button in the European and US equity futures. Um, typically when I see a move like that, I do like to just quickly pop it on a one minute to see the kind of composition of how the candlesticks are forming on a very short term basis because that's quite telling to whether or not this is a news based kind of move like a headline catalyst and perhaps there's a tweet somewhere or a headlines come out but just looking at this price movement here it looks a little bit more gradual than what you would normally see if there was just a one and done explosive headline reaction which of course would be much more uh, the first candlestick just exploding higher which this is more of a bid coming in so yeah it doesn't look like it's anything fundamental based um, break above pivot perhaps and if you look at the S&P here on the right that's also just broken above its Asia Pacific session high which was also the pivot level so maybe it's just a coordinated break of some technical levels overall uh, from a news perspective this morning things are, are relatively quiet there's not really a great deal going on and perhaps then just a, uh, the, the technical breach enough of a cue to see a little bit of a push on higher. Uh, consequently, a um, bit of mild risk on actually uh, with the stock move. Gold a little lower, uh, just coming in within close proximity of its S1. We're down around $7 at the moment and then the bottom chart here is the US 10 year. That's also been drifting south as well. Um, we're now trading down about eight ticks this morning. So yeah, interesting in the fixed income space, of course, after everyone was panicking about this kind of recessionary threat and the inversion of the yield curve. Well, everything's kind of flipped back over the last uh, day or two. And so definitely alleviating some of those near term fears that were, were definitely kind of growing from last week. So perhaps a little bit of renewed, uh, not risk on so much, but if anything, maybe a bit of almost profit taking on that the, that kind of negative build up in those shorts and so a bit of reversal on that move uh, yields back a little higher dollar although it did move lower yesterday afternoon uh, generally speaking is still trading up at you know close to these multi month highs as we were discussing yesterday um, as the trade talks kind of go into a renewed phase of being a little bit more positive perhaps um, so yeah interesting start to the morning uh, but again just to reaffirm not based on one singular headline uh, so to speak just generally a little bit more upbeat on the sentiment to get things underway um, going into the news then i'm going to discuss a couple of things then i'll hand you over to sam on the technical basis as a final reminder both sam and i will be going uh, live on youtube this evening at 6 p.m london time all you need to do is click subscribe on our youtube channel hit the bell uh, icon which will then turn on the notifications and you'll be alerted on your phone or your desktop and so on as soon as we go live. Um, the format of that is going to be, I'm going to cover a little bit about this inversion of the yield curve, what my expectations are, not only what does it mean but what do I think going forward in the timings of what can happen next uh, because I've had quite a lot of questions on that so we'll kick off on that and then we're going to take questions basically from our subscribers. So anything you want to talk about we're going to hopefully try to address and answer. And then what's going to be pretty cool is we're going to end the session with the FMC minutes. So we're going to cover that as well um, live as it happens. And I'll give you a bit of a short preview as well ahead of that. Um, so without further ado, let's go into some of the headlines. Uh, this was a very interesting one I saw yesterday. And this came out of uh, JP Morgan's head of macro quantitative and derivatives research. He, he is a fairly uh, famous fellow uh, in the marketplace, but he was talking about quite an interesting um, piece of analysis that he's done where he said, quote, portfolio rebalancing could drive equities up as much as 2% by the end of this month. So he said that after Treasuries rose and the S&P 500 index fell for three consecutive weeks, the divergence has left fixed portfolios 2% underweight stocks, essentially. So this isn't to do with uh, underlying fundamentals and the fact that you know corporates are becoming more positive or anything like that. This is purely to do with funds looking to rebalance what has been 
um, a lot of downside in the equity space, which has basically left them underweight stocks. And as we get into the end of the month, they need to rebalance. So they need to buy back, back to their original kind of composition of what was the structure of the portfolio in the first place. So more of a function of the latter means that potentially what he's suggesting is that we could see some decent upside um, in the equity space. I mean, actually, rather than look at it technically, what's 2% look like in the uh, S&P 500? Well, let's just have a quick look of what that would look like from the current price. Uh, let me just try stretch my chart out a bit more. 2% puts us back up at basically 2,900. Pretty much bang on if you were looking at the current price movement. So that would put us back above the, the kind of area of resistance that we had. You can see here, let me just make this a bit bigger, in the S&P 500 uh, over the course of really August for the best part. Uh, that would put us back up towards, let me just again stretch this chart out a bit more. Uh, 2900 obviously quite an interesting level as we get up to that mark a bit higher well excuse me not 2900 let me correct myself that would be the increment dollar gain um, from a, a nominal value if you were trading futures contracts of your your profit the actual value in the index would be 2969 three quarters if that was a two percent gain from the current price of where we are so having a look that again 29 um, 69 puts us in sight as well of some some fairly interesting technical points of interest so you know will this play out well this is just one guy's um expectation sorry mike's just reminded me of my switch over my chart so here we are so this is where we are at the moment just to recap again and a two percent appreciation of the s p would put us up at around this level here on the right hand side 29.69 three quarters that would take out that um, area the double top of the resistance that we've had from the 8th and the 13th of August and push us back up towards an area that does look quite technically relevant uh, from a resistance point of view having been pretty firm support in the previous setup through the month of July as well so yeah it'd be interesting to see definitely we tend to see this I mean if we look on the daily obviously on the S&P it's not uncommon to have these big kind of shakeouts in the market only then to rally back particularly aggressive uh, in the in the second phase I mean we had that back in the beginning February of 2018 we had that massive Q4 route and then the best S&P rally in 31 years in Q1 now we've had this uh, latest kind of pullback over the course of since late July and we've managed to already claw some of that back about 50% of the overall move but um, you know, some further upside here I don't think it could be ruled out entirely I don't think it would be that surprising to be honest um, near term area of interest probably on any further continuation to the upside looking on the daily here uh, that I would be looking at is probably two real levels and, and really that forms around a band of price action at 29.44 and 61 that starts to encapsulate then uh, some of these levels from the peak of interest that we had in May that high previous all-time high in sep october of 2018 then you can see here that was quite a key level as well and not just resistance but a platform of support for the eventual push up to the record highs that we had um, only a couple of weeks ago in fact so yeah interesting analysis and one that i'm sure will make the balls happy uh, but let's see uh, timing wise obviously it's the 21st so you've only got really a week and a half for this guy's prediction to come to fruition. So let's see if he yeah, will revisit this in a couple of days and see how that's playing out. Um, this was another thing I, I just wanted to share. This I know the graphic is a bit squashed, but this is a look at the activity of Trump, the US president, tweeting on the Fed and Fed policies. So no surprise at all to see this little... Uh, period here in Q4 of 2018 of you can see it's beginning to tweet about the Fed and its policies and then ramping it up almost doubling of the volume of tweets over that period if you remember if I was to map a chart of the S&P 500 the S&P 500 if you follow my mouse was basically going like this heading south so the more south it goes the more pressure he puts on the Fed um, then we had um, fairly consistent pattern through March, April, May, June, but then more recently, really since the official campaigning for 
um, 2020 has commenced. He's really ramped it up. Uh, and certainly since the Fed now have begun to cut, whether or not this is a mid-cycle adjustment yet to be seen, but you can see that it's gone up um, sharply. And as I've said before, I would very much continue to foresee this to be the case. Now, on the back of this, the other interesting graphic that I saw was one out of Bank of America. And they were talking about this idea that the Fed is unintentionally underwriting the trade war. And what they're talking about is this adverse feedback loop between the Fed and trade policy. So you know, it's pretty self-explanatory, but this is an interesting kind of way of just really in shorthand summarizing what's going on at the moment, which is that um, the more tariffs that are put into place, whether between the US and China or the US just generally globally, given its protectionist stance, equates to a weaker economy and therefore, as a net response, markets start to weaken, equity start to fall, and so on. What does that prompt if aggressive enough in its weakness? Well, then the Fed has to change course and take action and ease monetary policy. As a net result of that, then, what happens is by creating more stimulus, having a lower lending environment by cutting rates or restarting quantitative easing, um, confidence picks up economy then starts to respond and market strengthens as a result of Fed action. But the more the economy strengthens, then that gives more room for Trump to then in action further tariffs to keep the pressure on to get more um, concession from his uh, opposition in regards to the trade negotiations. And then the whole thing repeats itself. So again, it's, it's quite an interesting thing here. And, and it does again go back to this idea that it definitely plays into the hands of the president, this kind of win-win scenario where that passing of accountability of a lack of Fed action then can be blamed squarely at the, at the hands of Jerome Powell and his colleagues. But then if they respond, it gives Trump more room to then enact more aggressively on trying to um, uh, appear being more strong domestically on his negotiations on the foreign front. So quite, quite a, a nice, simple way of just looking at what's going on uh, at the moment. And, and really, I think what plays true as to why Trump is pretty much locked in to win 2020, all else remaining equal up to this point in about 18 months time. Moving away from that, um, the other big thing, the other big news in Italy is that Tommaso's got his hair cut <laughs> for the first time in a number of months he's gone from uh, uh, rural let's say rustic Italian freestyle hair and he's now I reckon he's lining up the position he's going to put his application in for the PM role in Italy um, and this is the this is the reason why the Italian president obviously uh, ready to give Salvini rivals time to seal a deal and this comes after the PM Conte resigned yesterday in protest basically um, of the the fact that he very much was critical of Salvini breaking up the existing coalition between the league and the five star. Um, timing wise then what have you got to be aware of? Well the Italian president Mattarella begins intensive talks with political leaders today to determine whether a new ruling coalition is viable or the country must hold um, fresh elections. Now what was quite interesting yesterday was you almost have quite a counterintuitive move to what you think might have happened, which was actually um, Italian yields fell. The thinking here being that, well, actually, this is going to delay the prospects of any type of snap election. And so therefore, consequently, BTP's actually rallied. So this is what I'm looking at here is the BTP. Uh, that did hit a bit of a, a near-term point of resistance from a, a high that we printed back on the 15th earlier this month. We tested that yesterday afternoon. We've had a look at it this morning before then a rejection and a decent push back to the downside uh, in the BTP. A um, few other things then to look out for in regards to Italy. Uh, consultations with the Italian president, uh, Mattarella, will start at 3 p.m. London time, so 4 p.m. local time in Rome. So if you were anticipating any further updates to do with Italy, 
most likely that's going to start coming late afternoon from a UK time perspective. Um, the other thing, sticking with uh, European politics, uh, we know that the G7 is happening in Baritz in France at the weekend. Uh, kicks off on um, Friday and I think it goes through the weekend. But ahead of that, Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, is doing a bit of a European roadshow. And obviously this is the first time he's really getting out and about in mainland Europe, which is obviously critical for him trying to garner some kind of support around uh, attempting to get a new concession from Europe about striking some kind of Brexit deal ahead of his threat of that um, no deal scenario on October 31st. So uh, Boris is looking to meet Angela Merkel today and then he's going to meet with the French President Macron on Thursday um, before then heading to the G7 meeting. Now what's really interesting here of course is that if you think about Europe you know, let's step away from Britain and Brexit for a second. Let's think about the Eurozone. The Eurozone is under quite incredible economic pressure at the moment, none other so than Germany, which has been seeing quite a severe contraction in its manufacturing sector, very much evident in the PMI data, uh, kind of suppressed readings in a lot of the soft indicators like iPhone and ZEW hitting multi-year lows. Uh, and this is very telling because Germany is not just subject to risk from a fallout of a messy Brexit, but also, of course, from being targeted, as they have done, from the Trump administration. Now, what's interesting then with these major European officials is that if they push back too much against Boris, well then, what could happen is that that could form an even tighter relationship between Boris and Trump. Trump, of which has already been quite a ardent backer of Boris's stance of playing into that same narrative of kind of taking back control and your sovereignty and, uh, and very much the uh, similar type of rhetoric that Trump has been pushing at home. So the interesting thing here is that Merkel and Macron are two of the staples of obviously European ideology and being of the largest economies, have the highest political influence over potentially shaping a Brexit deal with the UK. Can they maintain that firm stance though and not be bullied by the kind of Boris bluff, if you like, if that is the case? Because the risk for them is that not only are they in a politically weak situation in the Eurozone, is that they could then form um, a, a, a will distance themselves even further from Trump and a forming of a very strong alliance between Trump and Boris would be the last thing that um, Europe would want and hence the reason why Boris has been playing up to this and Trump has been tweeting in the last couple of days how he's had some great conversations with the Prime Minister all of these types of things are all definitely playing into the hands of Boris to go in pretty strong uh, with a, a kind of looming threat for these negotiations which I'm sure he'll be having with his European partners at the weekend. So, yeah, we'll be interested to see the outcome of this. Obviously, from these three, I'd say Salvini definitely much more trying to align himself with Trump, given his more uh, kind of natural nationalistic views that he has in the way he wants to govern. Uh, so he definitely is the outlier of the three. Merkel very much, just given the sensitivity to the German economy, more open to striking some kind of compromise and deal. Macron's the kind of Mr. Europe and the biggest uh, kind of block, I guess, to that happening. So maybe perhaps the Thursday conversation between the UK Prime Minister and the French President will be particularly of interest for markets. Um, final thing to talk about is we had the... API crude oil inventories last night. And to start off, let's just have a quick look at the, the crude chart. I mean, this was a, uh, a chart that I was looking at yesterday because we'd drawn up quite a distinctive trend line from the price activity. You can see highlighted from the ellipse here from the low point printed down at around a 50-50 price point on the 7th, retested multiple times. We got to that point, had almost like a false breakout and a run down to the, what was the S one on yesterday's daily pivots before then launching back higher and then uh, consequently the other trend line coming from some further back price action on the upside just containing as well as the previous highs you can see here from the price action over the course of the last 48 hours so quite a nice technical setup in oil 
Um, when it comes to the API infantry reaction, as you can see, it was basically zero. Market didn't really react at all. The numbers, so you are aware, was a crew drawdown of 3.45 million, which was a deeper draw than expected. Cushing a draw of 2.8 million, the biggest draw since Feb of 2018. Gasoline draw 400,000, distillate build 1.8 million. But rather than dwell on uh, infantry situation, I mean, the chart really says it all. It didn't really move on the data. And it's similar with the DOEs that we'll get later on this afternoon. As much as they can move the market, and WTI is sensitive in the intraday environment to that release, I think the bigger play in town is still a demand story uh, emanating out of the trade talks and this overall perception of global growth or recession fears um, that have come from this new obsession with the yield curve. So... I don't really see that being a game changer. The only time that that could really take hold is if then if I extend this trend line out a little further, if we were to get a break upon that, then what I'd be doing is then at that point, if we were to get a bearish report, big builds across the board, then just looking to target down at these previous areas of kind of relative significance, um, as you can see, following the trend lower uh, would be the approach. All right. That is it, though, from me. I'm going to hand you over to Sam. Um, so let me just switch over my charts. And then hopefully, if I don't see you in the chat room on Trading Live, I'll see you on YouTube later on this evening uh, for the event. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ant. And, uh, yeah, might as well start, talk, start talking uh, about oil here with the, uh, the trend line getting squeezed in from... Uh, the downside held well yesterday and, and we're already back up towards uh, that higher point and, and just to put this onto the daily as well uh, should that load up you can see we've we've got that really um, strong uh, test happening now of, of this this trend that's starting back on the the 15th of of july so certainly where we finish the the day and the weeks on on, on this trend line will be massively important and it's going to move this trend line down to where it, it would be and you can see just really held up nicely yesterday morning uh, the last test before that on the 13th and um, a, a decent push from yesterday's S1 that trend line up towards 56 and a half where we're trading now so if you're you know probably with, with the data out later there's no harm in sort of waiting for that but certainly if we can get a close above there you could well see a, a further push higher uh, to the downside, the same as yesterday, really just focusing on, on can you get a close of, of that, uh, that trend line and, and below there uh, will be obviously the main thing to focus on for uh, the, the day and, and session ahead. The euro relatively flat for, for the day now, just having a, a little bit of a, uh, a go at uh, trying to claw back the, the pivot after breaking through uh, that area, although we found support pretty much the high of yesterday, we eventually got through there late into the session. Um, and it still remains, and I'm just putting this on that longer time frame, you can just see near those lows and it's starting to do what it did uh, a couple of, well, I guess you could say, yeah, a couple of weeks ago where we're just get, almost making a new range and uh, you can see there, and then we have that push down and we're looking like we're just about to do the same kind of thing. So especially with the, the minutes later, um, which, you know, eyes will be on no harm in again for this just being a bit patient until maybe we come into the afternoon and evening before really getting too involved certainly to the upside i would be focusing on 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 any of those breakdown points should we we, we break above this range which i would say now comes in and just put this on to 60 minute you can see the r1 and the, the higher point from friday uh friday from sorry the 19th uh, monday is is pretty much bang in line and the, the double bottom from uh, Friday and yesterday as well for the lower part of that range so just keeping an eye on that yes the pivot is is pretty important and, and this area as such 111 11 has been you know influential really going back to the 16th and then the ninth the morning of the, the Monday high of yesterday morning before we broke through and then find the support now so it's a key midpoint uh, and I'd almost put it down to that level today's our one with the top end of that range and, and that double bottom waiting for the price to come to those looking back at the similar price action you can see from that week where we were stuck in it from the 6th to when we finally broke through eight days later 
uh, on the 14th. So for Euro, those will be the levels I'd focus on. The pound had a bit of a, a push, didn't it, yesterday before just drifting lower. Uh, and we're continuing to do that now below the pivot. Um, for both the euro and the pound, they were coming to that lower point of those those trends, and we we got a decent enough breakthrough, and then the, obviously the S1 came in. The, the story about Merkel really ignited price to the top end of its range. Uh, however, we have come back down since. I still have that trend line on from yesterday, despite what looks now like a, a bit of a false break. It was respected well before and then after on the breakthrough, so I'd still have that on uh, as a as a pretty key level. Uh, and likewise to the upside, if we can get back, back above that range, today's R1 uh, and the high of the SIP looks pretty important. Uh, the pivot obviously is, a, is an area to, to focus on, but uh, should we get back down to, back up I should say, to any of those previous lows around 121.69, uh, I also quite like look, the look of that. Intraday levels, you can see 28 and 19, we had some good uh, resistance slash support yesterday so they would be important before we got down to that trend line uh, quick look over at gold which uh, with equities having just pushed higher and reaching their highs of the day in the states you got gold coming under pressure uh, and finally uh, breaking through 15 11 and a half which held so well yesterday and then uh, 6 a.m. before that breakdown you can see uh, S1 providing a bit of support, key level below there, the double bottom from yesterday and Monday also in the picture and then the, the double top as well, so similar to the Euro in that you're perhaps getting this new range coming in uh, that you would like to, to be focused on uh, as well for, for gold and, and again with the Fed minutes later, no harm in just sort of being a bit patient uh, today as the market will of course be, be waiting around uh, for that as well. The S&P as mentioned as, as Ant did push higher and the Nasdaq actually is the one that has really pushed on already reaching that R1. The Dow Jones and the S&P much more relaxed in terms of not quite making uh, that that level. The S&P is putting this onto that daily chart and we talked in the briefing about the, the trend line yesterday. Let's bring this in now. Let's have that drawn on. You can see just how well that was respected. And we were talking about as well how, how it was so similar to October, November, December last year. Not saying that's the high, but it's just very important to keep an eye on what happens around that trend line. Certainly should we get up there again. Uh, bulls and bears will want to be protecting, or the bears protecting the bulls looking to, to get through that. So intraday, where's that trend line looking like it's going to come in? If we were to come up now, anywhere between... I guess 29, 28 and, and 30 would be the level of interest and that for me is the, the key level uh, for the week really. To the downside, uh, if we were to, to get another push below 2900, obviously the low of, of the day which was the high we had back on the, the afternoon of Friday, so that's pretty important and also back down towards 28.78 is pretty key from a price action uh, point of view. Uh, but for me, all about that trend line and Certainly the way that the market has started today uh, looks pretty strong. Eurostox and DAX already above their, well, Eurostox above the R1 and the DAX just testing that now. And that key level in the DAX from yesterday's high uh, and also Monday's high. So that high of the week, been tested a couple of times. Can we get a, a third test of that? And again, just like a couple of these other markets, we're in this little range, aren't we, where you've got a clear defined double bottom and double top, Euro, gold, the DAX all very similar. Trend lines important, S&P and oil, and uh, they uh, are not too far away from, from being tested. Um, obviously some interesting, uh, could be an interesting evening, depending on, on what comes out. T-notes also down with gold and, and the Bund following suit there uh, as well. Any questions as usual, please uh, do let us know. I'm looking forward to, to catching up with you all guys uh, later on on, on YouTube. So please do make sure you uh, you join in. I hope you'll have a, a good uh, good morning and catch you all later on.